lots of footage of us driving to preparation day. Yay. Yesterday was pre-preparation day, so that we didn't feel rushed today. But we've got four jobs, haven't we? This series is the story of the new amphibious Arctic vehicle project named Bernard. Building on ideas, skills and questions raised during the Allen lifeboat conversion, as a team we will share all those moments needed to get Bernard up north, onto the ice and making himself useful. Today we've got to sort out um, the foam with all the little bits of glass fibre coming through. We've got to try and flatten a piece of foam. We've got to pot up all the resin, that's going to be quite a big job, and then put the gum tape around the perimeter of the mould. And that will then hopefully mean that tomorrow when we're laminating we've got less stuff to do. Um, that was supposed to be a really wide lens. Is my head really big? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're nearly there. Weather's perfect. After, like, what was it? Two, three failed attempts to do this. We have the right temperatures. It's not too sunny. It's not too windy. It's not. Oh, Bernard. With rain, um, we're going to have to put a Bernard in there. Um, yeah. That's perfect. Life is good. <laughs> and it's my brand new camera. Yeah. First ever clip of my new camera. I'm sure you would have noticed there's been a little bit of a gap between the previous episode and this one, and that's because we've had a million different things to do in the meantime. I didn't really feel like I was ready to present you with anything concrete. That said, I am going to split this episode into the pre-lamination, the prep phase, and also then the proper lamination, because I want that to be a distinct episode. So this one's going to be not a hastily put together one, um, but one that I'm, I'm sure you will see has got a little bit of hot spots of topics. Anyhow, I hope it's interesting in the lead up to the main lamination episode. That said, we both needed a short while to adjust to the different camera menu settings. Now I had to figure out. First of all, time to actually get this enormous box of not yet deployed Gurit Corsell foam out of the storage workshop. I forever seem to swim against the tide when it comes to ridding my life of large items that clutter up places of otherwise orderly serenity. But also hiding in there are the cut, slotted and chamfered foam sections that will provide the additional stiffness for the flat and slightly curved sections of Bernard's shell. We need to make a final modification to the sheets, putting into action the lessons from all that interlamination, bonding, strength and delamination testing we did months ago, but not before this cinematic drama caused by accidentally switching the new camera into slow motion mode. Having someone other than me filming also makes room for thinly veiled digs such as this. But now to completing the foam and we thought having them upright would be easiest. All of these slots need to be filled, and you'll forgive me for showing you the neater ones, not the handful where the saw blade slipped and marked the foam. Individually cut slips of glass fibre at 600 grams per square metre. Glass, if combined with epoxy, gives superior adhesion compared to other composite fabrics. It's unidirectional, so we need all the strength along the length of those tongues. This needed doing across all of the shaped sheets. The left one is a side panel, and the other one is for Bernard's rear end. Then we needed to flatten them down. I'm using a premium resin compatible spray and doing so sparingly as it's premium. Although a handful would need to be a U shape either side of the foam, the majority can be an S shape. Fibres are always at their strongest the flatter and least crimped they are. This went on for a while, but it's quite cathartic and the least taxing task for our prep day. Whilst it being not an established technique for foam cord laminates, I'm convinced this will significantly enhance Bernard's integrity and resilience over a working life. The second workshop is now laid out well, and I've added more shelving, although I have more racks in mind to maximise capacity. Of course, it's now home to all the bottled up resin and the compressor. Also, proper canister face masks so that the compressor and sprayed resin won't be the end of me. Concerned people of the channel will be proud, I'm sure. Hopefully you can see the gradual improvement in here, but back to the other number one container. You see me being very organised. You see, rope goes in, the string and rope box. This is the sort of organisation we do on our channel. Over here next to the kitchen. Although action cameras and indeed iPhones have their roles, the addition of more full-size cameras means that we can get better quality cutaways and second camera angles, especially in low light. Also, better colour consistency. It will probably not escape your notice that on this episode, despite the fact that I'm going on and on about how the new cameras are able to give us new possibilities with second camera setups and better colour consistency, that's not the case this time. And that's because we've been 
playing around with loads of settings. We've been making mistakes. And you'll notice that in some of the clips, the highlights, the bright areas are really blown out. And I've tried to recover the details as much as I possibly can, but there's a limit to what you can manage with, with even good quality camera sensors. Uh, also in Marielle's uh, footage, which she's very kindly donated, uh, her camera was set to a higher sharpness setting. And that's really hard to undo. I tend to run my own cameras at quite low sharpness. And so that's why there might be a little bit of disparity. Anywho, this is a bit of an experimentation phase. And I promise you, that going onwards we will have better image quality and the second camera will actually start to enhance rather than detract. Ordering the cameras from really small to really massive and it turns out that we really like Sony's. Sony, Sony, Sony. Um, yeah, this is called prevarication when we, we've got a job ahead that we're slightly not looking forward to. <laughs> Next, I need to get the foam oven out again and make it even better. So we're um, expanding the foam forming oven heating area I guess you call it because we need to do a larger sheet and um, I think also we were getting the duct where the hot air comes in a little bit too close to the foam and it was causing a little bit of warping in that first little zone and so I think to save the foam we'll, um, we'll just try to make the whole thing a little bit deeper but it turns out that the piece of spare OSB that I've got is three centimeters too small so I have to cut some more. If you remember the incremental success I had with the oven, key facets were low volume and as decent an airflow as possible so the foam is heated evenly. It's sized for a full sheet, but in their inimitable way, the foam sheets have their own idea of a full sheet, and I want to offer space in front of the foam so that the area in line with the duct isn't overheated. So it's a simple matter of some extensions with MDF opcuts, some extra screws, and a moderate to positive outlook on life in general and this mini project in particular. I was temporarily out of short, but not too short, screws, and so the mini grinder has to be deployed to make the necessary sparks fly and spikes disappear. Also, it can be quite useful for me to clarify what I'm doing in my own head. Anyhow, I expressed many thoughts and made many gestures. I put the foam roof on, but we'll need to order more to cover the extra surface area, and may even get more so I can cover the gaps and improve efficiency. Finally, getting the propane heater installed. We'll have it quite close, because we want to get actually a lot of heat in there, because there's the OSB both sides of it and the danger is it will all sort of suck sucking up the heat and not letting it get into the foam so we will have a short duct direct no wiggles I won't go over the method and principle again as it's had its own episode but in essence I want to recover that sheet of slightly misshapen Corsell foam back to flat again so I can then try and gently bend it back again more precisely they cost over a hundred pounds so it is worth it but since we had to bodge the top lid as the new foam panels hadn't arrived, and also the weights I needed to add to press the sheet flat down disrupted the airflow, we got easily up to temperature on the front side, but barely above 40 degrees the exit side. I'll fix this and update in a later episode. Let's turn to my resin spray apparatus. So the reason why we're shortening these slightly is so that when we are angling them down, we're not going to end up spilling resin out of the cup that's being angled over too far. If it's set down a little bit lower, then we'll be able to angle it down in the spraying booth and then keep the resin in the pot, but still get the angle that we need. That's the plan. These are just a little bit too long. This is a grinding machine. And yes, this episode, we are going to have some metal cutting action and it's not going to be me that's doing it. I got three of these really cheap wide nozzle compressed air sprayer heads and we need to adjust the feed pipe as it's too long. They're designed for single-use tubes or pots of screw-on car underspray or grease or other delightful gloopy things. The sharp ends are now of course offensive weapons, but since Bernard is to be the only one of those we want in the yard at the moment, we can sort that out with a mini flap wheel and then finish off with rather imperfect use of a manual flap file since my round one has gone AWOL. All right, I think that's done. Now for the resin pouring session because it's going to be requiring a lot less. Anything else to say? That crow is always there keeping watch, but the black cat has been missing. Is there something going on here? Preferably not, as any sinister semi-supernatural corvid feline plotting would get in the way of our important resin preparation session. To massively speed up laminating from these purpose-made resin pots, we can measure up doses the day before, and we need a few dozen of them, all poured quickly and accurately from these decanted two-litre bottles. The resin, unlike the hardener, is stable in these bottles, but we do need to stop moisture interacting with the resin, even though it's only 24 hours they'll be potted up. Polyethylene film and a rubber band will do it. Yes, we've done 13 of blue. It was going to be 11, but we're having a little bit less in the pots because we thought that the pots will end up at a bit of an angle and we might get a bit of a slop, which we don't want. So now we're doing the one that will be for the unidirectional, long, longitudinal carbon fibre. 
The idea of knocking these pots over, worth £20 each, with one of my many expressive full arm gestures would be sad, so we boxed them up for organisation and protection. Whilst the resin potting would take an hour or so longer, I wanted to make use of daylight. It's mid-October at the time of filming, and our long summer evenings are a memory. We had mould work to finish. On top are those troublesome foam sheets. The short section I tried to cold bend with some weights, which does not work. The rear section I'd formed in the oven to roughly the right curve, but as I said, it's not uniform and will cause drama. A few jobs. I want a perimeter of spill control absorbent floor towel from Alan the lifeboat's engine bay, in fact, around the edge to catch resin drips. I then needed to gently slice back some of the black film on the concave curves. Whatever release cover I seem to use shrinks a little with time, and this tension release is quick and easy. It has not escaped my notice that a lot of members of the channel, and that means everyone from the more modest levels to the extreme higher tier members of channel membership, not all are watching the bonus episodes, and that may well be because every single month when I release them, you're not getting notifications or you're not aware that they even exist. If you are a member of the channel or if you are someone who excellently wants to become a member of the channel, there are monthly extra bonus videos that I'm doing for you. And so they are going to be sent uh, to a page which you should have access to, you should have a password to, but I'm not sending lots and lots of hassling email reminders because I don't want to end up in your spam filters. So please, if you are a member and you should be getting them but are somehow unaware, do let me know and I will redirect you towards the link that you need. Uh, in addition, I want a little bit of input. Uh, those of you who are interested in watching the bonus videos, uh, send me messages either in the comments section or just via direct email or DM or whatever it is of topics that you would like covered and I will try and do that. I'm covering things all the way from Arctic expedition techniques, uh, Arctic history, Bernard Allen. I will do episodes on absolutely anything that's linked to my work. So if you do have any hints or tips about what you like covered in those, uh, those bonus videos, do let me know. Thanks so much to uh, members of the channel. You are more than tolerated. You are genuinely appreciated. Cheers. Good. So I'm gonna leave these just loose on top and to the peel ply will simply sit on top and that means if it is slightly pulled in it will have some give. I've already been round and I've trimmed any areas that were kind of a little bit pockety like with a bit of a balloon underneath so the air can escape. Otherwise we're looking pretty good. I was thinking about really really cleaning it but any little bits of dust will get stuck in the peel ply and it'll just get ripped off so it's slightly bad practice but I think we spent ages and then in the morning you'll have dust on it again. So so what we need is a patron of the channel to pay for a large warehouse and workshop for us. This is a pretty good moment to thank one of the two key suppliers for this big layup job. Most gear, save for the resin, like this bagging gum seal tape, was supplied along with sourcing tough to find fabrics by the team at East Coast Fiberglass Supplies, link in the description. And that gum tape will need to run, of course, continually around the lower edge of the part. It will run along one long piece of Gorilla Tape, the top film of which provides an excellent surface to seal down upon, and it's easy to wipe clean with alcohol on a clean cloth. Amazingly, I think one single length of this gum tape is gonna get us all the way around, almost wow. exactly. It started off about this big, <laughs> and it's been continuous, luckily continuous, all the way around. Should get us there. Every single centimeter has gotta be properly Consolidated down. This is almost exactly 24 meters in length and the close attention paid here is vital for later. So what you can probably see is that we have some light set up so we'll be able to work past sunset because the idea of doing this in late summer is unfortunately not really working out for us right now. Uh, so we've done the gum tape, done all the perimeter and uh, the two of us have finished off by putting this extremely wide strip of uh, low tack masking tape all the way along and around only affixed at the top and sort of just flapping at the bottom and that means that any drips of resin that might come down the sides of the mold during the lamination which is kind of inevitable even if we have quite viscous uh, resin with the relatively low temperatures so it will be in the teens uh, it will mean that it won't drip down onto the gum tape which could ruin the seal that would be a complete disaster so that's a uh, protective layer that will come off just before we put down the vacuum bag and press around the uh, the edge there to form the seal and pull the vacuum down mold done and we did do an hour or so more resin potting which sounds like the perfect friday night to all of us on this channel do concur by subscribing or commenting with good-natured abuse 
we have well over 100 liters of this top quality Gurit and Preg laminating resin here and some of their extra slow hardener. The amount of input that the team down on the Isle of Wight have had with this project is, is really remarkable. Thank you so, so much for that. And uh, I'm hoping that the majority of the burner project will be laminated with Gurit. Uh, it's great quality resin. It cures nicely. It's easy to work with. Uh, and it's in, in particular beyond just providing uh, incredibly good prices, the raw materials, uh, advice, stuff that I never would have guessed has been uh, invaluable. So cheers to Gurit. Again, link in the description. We decided that um, gold was too similar to yellow, uh, and so we decided to add some black. And weirdly, we've got what we have christened... Bile. Yeah, we've got bile colour. We started off with the vomit, and we decided it's bile instead. So I said, I'm sure if your bile looks like that, you should probably see more than one doctor. We did that more. Some pigment colours were in fact not bile, like British Racing Green and a rather smart royal blue. This is a big moment. Um, let me turn off the podcast so that we can actually really enjoy this. Now, are you going to get it exactly on 500? The pressure. <laughs> Let's see. By the way, we are allowed 1% of error either way, um, as is the normal epoxy resin thing. But we have been, of course, aiming for exactly 500 grams in each. Oh, 492, 494. We're not doing it this exactly every time, by the way. Otherwise, we'll be here for yes. four weeks. 500. 500. <laughs> I didn't even see your moment of triumph, well done. <laughs> and the epoxy. <laughs> I had clean gloves. I had clean gloves. Mariella's are going to do the honours. There we go. Dick. So we've only had one unhappy face today. We failed on the foam. With such ignominious defeat, I didn't even get a moment of peace with my wine back at the Airbnb. But I introduced mince pies to the Hispanosphere with success and rave reviews. That's nice. I can't do the same thing I did last time because that's like the same end of the episode. <laughs> I, also, I also really hate it when YouTubers do that kind of, see you next time. Bye.